Hello, my name's Adrian Goldberg and welcome to the Byline Times podcast. The Byline Times, it's what the papers don't say, what radio doesn't report and what telly doesn't tell you. This time, has Amnesty International unwittingly become a tool for Russian propaganda? That claim was made by Oksana Pokolchuk, director of Amnesty's Ukraine branch, who resigned on Friday. She was responding to a report by Amnesty International which criticised the Ukrainian army for endangering civilians and said that, although unwillingly, the organisation created material that sounds like support for Russian narratives. Seeking to protect civilians, the study has instead become a tool of Russian propaganda. We'll hear shortly from Tom Much in Kyiv. It was written in the Byline Times that he warned Amnesty before the controversial report came out that they would be making a mistake to publish it. Before that, a quick reminder that the Byline Times podcast is funded by subscriptions to the Byline Times, our brilliant monthly newspaper in which Tom sometimes writes. We're not bankrolled by oligarchs or nom-doms. We can report without fear or favour and hold the rich and the powerful to account because our funding comes from ordinary subscribers, people like you. So if you can, please subscribe to the Byline Times. You get details of how to subscribe at bylinetimes.com. That's at bylinetimes.com. And if you have already subscribed, thank you. Now, you might hear a little bit of background noise. That's because Tom Much is with us in Kiev. How are you doing, Tom? Not so bad. How about yourself, Adrian? Yeah, well, lovely to hear from you. And I'll just let listeners know a little bit about the report published by Amnesty. It was based on a three-month investigation, and you can read it in full on the Amnesty website. It says Ukrainian forces have put civilians in harm's way by establishing bases and operating weapon systems in populated residential areas, including schools and hospitals. Amnesty says these tactics violate international humanitarian law and endanger civilians who in some cases have been killed by Russian strikes. Being in a defensive position, Amnesty says, does not exempt the Ukrainian military from respecting international humanitarian law. That's a pretty powerful charge sheet, Tom. But you were against this report from the start. Tell us why. I met the Amnesty team in mid to late May. We were both researching in the same areas in the Donbass, where at that time the majority of the fighting was taking place. Now, everyone, there were quite a few journalists and NGO workers there, and most of us were looking into the effects of the Russian strikes. However, I met the lead Amnesty researcher there, and she was far more concerned with the fact that Ukrainian forces had taken up positions. Now, we need to be clear that the only positions they located weren't artillery positions or fighting positions. They were literally just places where soldiers were sleeping, and some of them were close to civilian apartment blocks. Now, for them, this was a quote-unquote clear violation of international humanitarian law. However, from the very start, and I had this conversation with them, I said, well, look, Because the Ukrainian forces are in a defensive position, what they have to do is they have to balance proportionality. They can't just let the Russians walk into their cities. They they need to protect the areas they are tasked to defend. She also said that, well, in that case, you know, they must make all efforts to evacuate civilians from the area or give them the chance to leave. And I counted with the fact that, well, the Ukrainian armed forces and Ukrainian local authorities and a huge big group of volunteers have been doing just that but there are a large number of civilians who for whatever reason some of them don't want to leave their homes some of them are too scared to leave there are the occasional ones that are literally just pro-russian and would prefer the russians to take over but for whatever reason these civilians won't leave you cannot compel civilians to leave these areas now when the amnesty report came out what it ended up saying was that they had no information that there were evacuation routes that had been opened or that, or that the Ukrainian authorities had made, you know, had attempted to evacuate civilians. That was just plain wrong. That, like, that's just factually incorrect. Not only that, but we all saw it. And frequently, journalists were even invited along on evacuation rides to witness them. So we witnessed the Ukrainian army evacuating civilians, and I don't know how Amnesty International missed that. And the bigger context here, of course, is the fact that Russia invaded Ukraine. Precisely. And it's not just the fact that Russia invaded Ukraine. 
It's that we've seen what we've seen in Bucha, we've seen in Kherson, we've seen in Kharkiv. We have seen what Russian occupation means for civilians. What it means is it means arbitrary executions. It means a complete suppression of civil society and their civil rights and liberties. It means in the worst cases, rapes and massacres and every sort of horror imaginable. And the Ukrainian military is tasked with defending that. Now, the report never makes that context clear. The Amnesty report argues that there were areas such as military bases or densely wooded areas or other structures away from residential areas that they could have used instead of civilian areas? Okay, let's just say, for instance, that in a town they decide not to move into the town and they decide to move into a field. Well, Amnesty International has no way of knowing, one, does that field have all of the necessary equipment, you know, or facilities? We're talking things like, you know, large availability of underground structures. The school in particular that they used had a basement, which was why the soldiers were sleeping there. Does it mean that their weapon systems can no longer see or are no longer in range of the Russian particular systems? You know, there are, or are there, if the Ukrainian soldiers take a position in a field, can the Russians not just bypass them and walk straight into the city? Thing is, the amnesty report is so vague, and perhaps they're going to release more evidence of this, but it's so vague that none of those questions are answered. They just take the, the uh, my, my, my point I'm trying to make is how does amnesty have any insight into the Ukrainian military's military calculations. Yeah, I mean, it's one thing, isn't it, to understand what international humanitarian law says, but it's quite another to stand, as it were, on the sidelines and identify what is likely to be a successful military strategy for a nation defending itself from unprovoked hostile invasion. Yeah, this is exactly correct. It's And one of the problems that I had is, look, when this report was released and when it got a lot of the very justly deserved criticism, rather than taking that criticism on board, Amnesty just said, look, this is just evidence of our impartiality. Now, what I suspect happened is that Amnesty International, in an attempt to prove that they were impartial, we're in effect trying to pin something on the Ukrainian forces so they can be like, look, we're even handed. We criticize the Russians when it's valid. We criticize the Ukrainians when it's valid. And as I made the point when I wrote in the byline times, I said this is a form of victim blaming and that it equates the invader with the invaded and the, you know, the aggressor with the, with the, with the person being attacked, with the country in this case being attacked. Yeah, I mean, it's a false equivalence, isn't it? Most people, anyway, would acknowledge that is a a false equivalence. At the same time, in their report, they do quote individuals, residents who were in populated areas in this region who are critical of the Ukrainian military. So there's two, two ways to look at that. One, I'm not sitting here and saying that everything that the Ukrainian military has done is, you know, is perfect or is perfectly above board. And there is, it's very possible that there are individual cases where the Ukrainians have not gotten the balance between protecting civilians and their military strategy quite accurate in a war with, you know, an 800 kilometer front line and a huge amount of fighting that is going to happen in some cases. There's just no way to avoid it. The problem is, is that Amnesty made it out as if This was either intentional or systematic, and they did not provide any evidence of this being the case. The second thing is, is that, look, I also went to a camp, like at the school in Bakhmut, that was one of the issues in the report. We went there and we actually had, you know, we had civilians say to us, please don't take any any photos of any soldiers in this town. We're worried the Russians will will, will see those and and attack us again. Now, this is a a difficult situation because all of those civilians had been, at least the ones we spoke to, had been offered the chance to, had one, been told to evacuate, and two, been offered the chance to evacuate and had chosen not to. Now, it's very, very difficult, but in this situation, it's difficult to know what the Ukrainian military could have done more for them because they had offered them evacuations, as I said, that we had all seen. 
And as you suggested, it would be wrong to exonerate the Ukrainian army from any abuses that it, that it might perpetuate. But, but that's not really what you're saying, is it? You're saying that, look, there is not proportionality here. There is not equivalence here. And that to treat it as simply 50-50, two equal sides, as the Amnesty report appears to do, is just plain wrong. Yeah, this is the problem that I had with the Amnesty report. And it also seems, and one of the other problems is, is that if you actually read the, the report, the, or at least the new, I think it was just the news summary they released, there's a huge amount of vagueness to it. For instance, there's one moment in Mikolaev where they said, we were in a populated area and we could hear outgoing Ukrainian fire. Well, I mean, that's that's so vague. They don't know what artillery pieces were being used. They don't actually know where those artillery pieces were because they didn't cite them. They didn't know if that particular area had been cleared of civilians. And you have other cases, you know, where we don't get the information as to whether they are to whether, you know, the civilians in the area were warned about the Ukrainian presence or were offered the chance to evacuate. It's so vague and insubstantial on the details that it does it, it doesn't actually make any one specific allegation that in this particular area they clearly committed a crime, a war crime, by basing military installations or military personnel there. I'll give you another example. For instance, they say, oh, the use of hospitals as bases. And they said, at one point, we observed a dozen or so Ukrainian soldiers milling around in a hospital and eating. Well, we don't know what those soldiers were doing in the hospital. Perhaps they were tasked to defend that hospital. Perhaps, you know, some of them were getting treatment. Very possible that the Ukrainians set up a base in that hospital. But from the information that Amnesty gives us, we just don't know that. And that's the thing. It's all of these kind of very vague insinuations and sort of pieces of evidence that don't coalesce into a whole that are used to support a very, very grave charge, which is that the Ukrainian armed forces are systematically putting their own civilians in harm's way. It's just a sloppy report. And Tom, I mentioned right at the start of this interview that you did blow the whistle or attempt to blow the whistle in advance of the publication of this report and warn him, Amnesty that you felt anyway that it was not going to be reliable. So as I said, when we had our meeting in that hotel, I, I want to make clear this was not in any way some official formal meeting where Amnesty came to me and specifically solicited my advice as a conflict expert or anything. This is literally just the fact that we were sitting around in our hotel as journalists and researchers do and discussing our findings. And I said to them, look, this is going to you know, no one's, this is going to go down terribly because you don't give any idea, because you make a false equivalence and because you don't give any way that the Ukrainians could defend urban terrain. Like when I asked them, for instance, how would you plan to defend the city of Kharkiv without having troops stationed somewhere within the city? And she was like, it doesn't matter. International humanitarian law is clear. They need to find somewhere away from populated areas. And this was suggested that it even include like a field next door or something. What, you're just going to let the Russians walk into Kharkiv and take the entire city, your second biggest city, because... You, you, you don't want to station your troops in a populated area. And I said, people will read the report and think that's rubbish. That's exactly what turned out to happen. How do you think the report has left Amnesty's reputation? Well, I mean, it's not a very good look at all. It, first, they have, first, the report itself was rightly torn to shreds. It was torn to shreds on a factual basis. It was torn to shreds on an evidentiary basis. It was torn to shreds on a legal basis by a, a large variety of journalists and experts. But I think what's further damaged Am Amnesty's credibility is how they have responded and reacted. First, there was that absolutely dreadful tweet by the Secretary General of Amnesty International saying that their attackers were Ukrainian mobs and trolls and, you know, that's a, well, not just the journalists, but that's including her own local amnesty team who resigned in disgust at their report. 
And then they tried to come out and say, well, actually, no, we regret the way the report was framed and how it might be able to be twisted. But they never have, they have still, I think it's been, what, five, six days since they published this report, and they still haven't addressed any of the criticism, any of the evidentiary or factual or legal criticism. They still stand by the report. And I think until they actually make a proper accounting of what went wrong and the criticisms that have laid, been laid against them, People and won't I, be able to take Amnesty International seriously in this conflict. And as I look at the report now, I mean, it's headlined Ukraine, Ukrainian fighting tactics in danger civilians. That is the top line on the Amnesty website. If you go down to the bottom paragraph, indiscriminate attacks by Russian forces. So there are several paragraphs which detail the alleged abuses by the Ukrainian forces, Russia, which the report acknowledges has been using cluster bombs, which uh, kill civilians indiscriminately. That's the bottom paragraph of the report, which, again, when you take the, the entire context of the invasion, why would you do that? Which is the most damning and damaging finding? Well, Russia has been using bombs which are banned under international law. That's the final paragraph. Yeah, I should make clear one thing. This is a this is quite a niche international law point, but it was made to be by a military expert, is that in this particular conflict, while cluster bombs are widely banned, neither Ukraine or Russia had signed up to the international treaty. So technically, it's not a violation for them to be used. However, going back to the point about discrimination, if Russia's attacks are indiscriminate, that means that they're not discriminating between civilian and military targets, the whole report is kind of pointless because it doesn't matter whether the Ukrainians are basing themselves within civilian infrastructure or not, if the Russians are going to be completely indiscriminate in their attacks. And this is the worst part about the report, is that we're already seeing the Russians you wave it around and be like, look, Amnesty International has verified what the Russian government has say, been saying all along. Schools and hospitals, whenever you see them attack, there was always Ukrainian military in there. In the next months, when, as they undoubtedly will, they will indiscriminately attack civilian areas, they will say, Amnesty International proved that the Ukrainian forces are hiding everywhere. And it will be used by... Ru this is why this, is, this report, sloppiness, is so important, because it will be used in the future to justify future aggression against non-combatants. This sounds like a, a dangerous naivety on the part of Amnesty. Yes, and I would think that's quite ironic because one of the things that we talked about at the very end of our, our, our my meeting with Amnesty is they say is she made the point that she had more than 20 years experience documenting war crimes and in conflict research and was like kind of gave me a little sort of lecture in, you know, all governments will always lie to you. Your job is just to be strictly impartial, as if I was the naive one. Well, I mean, it, it turns out that it looks like Amnesty has been, in this case, yes, the naive ones. And this is despite the many, many years of experience that they have. And so this is why there's no excuse. This is not like an intern screwing up a bit of social media posting or anything. This is a problem that goes to the highest level of Amnesty's organisation. On your Byline Times article, you say that you contacted Amnesty International quite properly for a response to the claims you were going to make in the article. I've also contacted them. You said in your article that you'd heard nothing back from them. I've heard nothing back from them. Have you heard anything from them since by way of response? I haven't. I am talking to one other journalist who's doing an article, and he has had apparently... They're, they've not even designated anyone for comment on this. He said that they had responded to a few of the other claims, but that they haven't responded to any of the detailed criticism of the report yet. So, yeah, we're still really waiting for Amnesty to come out and say, you know, uh, this is our side of the story. This is our side of what was going on in Kramatorsk at the time. You asked them for a response. You've had nothing. No, no, no one that I know has, uh, except for this one guy has had a response.
No. Okay. Well, if they do send a response, I've given them a deadline. If it's later than the deadline and I do get a response, I'll put it on the hosting page of the podcast so that people can see it. I'll also send it to you, Tom, so that you can update the Byline Times article. But in the meantime, thank you. That's uh, Tom Much in Kiev. Thank you very much indeed. And you can read more from people like Tom and other great writers on our website at bylinetimes.com and in our brilliant monthly newspaper, The Byline Times. Subscriptions to The Byline Times are what fund this podcast, so please support it if you can. It's also a great newspaper. Get more details at bylinetimes.com. I'm Adrian Goldberg. You've been listening to The Byline Times Podcast. See you soon. <laughs>